to everybody who's just joined, thank you very much for joining and being super enthusiastic. You're you're early for the for the forum, so as you can tell, we're all waiting for everybody else to log in. My name is May Ann. I am the executive director for the Asia Cloud Computing Association, as well as the uh, director for the Fair Tech. Uh, Institute at Access Partnership. We're going to wait a couple more moments for people to log in because I know that switching sometimes from Zoom to Teams to WebEx to whatever it is that you've been using takes a little bit of switching and sometimes the these settings get a little bit messed up. So just uh, hang tight while we wait for everybody to log in. But thank you very much for being early. Uh, we do have a few minutes. Go get your go grab a cup of coffee and uh, while we prepare ourselves to talk for talk about cloud adoptions within ASEAN. Thanks everybody, see you in a couple minutes. Thank you everybody for joining us. This is May Ann. I am the Executive Director of the Asia Cloud Computing Association and also the Director of the Fair Tech Institute at Access Partnerships. Thank you very much for joining us today at the uh, seminar talking about facilitating cloud adoption in ASEAN. Um, I do see that we do have a number of people online and I do think that we have a uh, number of people who still aren't logged in, but that's okay. I would really like to ensure that we respect your time and thank you very much for joining in uh, on, on schedule. And we want to make sure that we obviously maximize the time that we have for uh, questions and answers and discussions. So thank you very, very much. I'd like to begin uh, before introducing everybody to each other. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of countries throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present, uh, and emergent and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I also like to acknowledge the elders from all the lands and language groups across all ASEAN member states. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are definitely here to talk about cloud computing and just starting a little bit with some housekeeping roles in the first instance. We do have uh, colleagues at the APEC Study Center at RMIT, Kevin, Lynn, uh, Bonnie, um, Access Partnership, uh, FISA, Grace and Australia, Australian Aid Defect Funding. So we want to thank you, uh, thank all of you at the um, uh, ASEAN Australia Digital Trade Standards Initiative for, for working together with us to put together this uh, seminar. What we're going to be doing is chatting a little bit about the 
uh, about cloud computing. And can I get Kevin, maybe you can stop uh, sharing in the first instance so that I can show people our speaker faces while I introduce them. OK, great. If you can swap around and we'll we'll go, we'll um, introduce uh, Sassoon, Ting Yan, Ziming, and then Bless in the first instance. So if you need to do any spotlighting of uh, their, their profiles, please go ahead and do it. Uh, let me let me get Sassoon to do a quick introduction of himself and what you're what he's covering. Sassoon, um, over to you. Thank you, Mayan, and uh, thank you for inviting me to join this very esteemed panel. Uh, my name is Sassoon Gregorian. I'm I look after government affairs for Salesforce across APAC and Japan, and uh, been in technology industry for about fifteen years for a number of different companies, and uh, have a very strong interest on this topic on on cloud adoption. Thank you. Thanks, Sassoon. Uh, Hing Yen, over to you. Hi, I'm, I'm Heng Yan with the Cloud Security Alliance, but my uh, past life as a uh, May has mentioned deals with uh, cloud adoption. So I was for many years, almost 10 years with the Singapore government, uh, taking care of the National Cloud Computing Office where we formulated plans to put in place a cloud computing ecosystem in Singapore. So I will be sharing some of these plans afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Hing Yen. It's it uh, being in the cloud computing industry is like playing Pokemon. You know, after a while, you evolve into a different type of monster. <laughs> you just grow up into a different thing. Uh, Zuming, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about your Pokemon journey in uh, in cloud computing? All right, thanks, man. Um, okay, uh, my I'm working for the Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, and uh, basically we do pretty much everything we need to grow the digital economy in Malaysia. And that includes uh, uh, digital transformation, but we, we do see that cloud is the necessity for this digital transformation to happen, right? So we are promoting the use of cloud throughout uh, both industry as well as in the government. Um, so I think uh, that's all I want to say for now. Thank you. Thanks, Zuming. I hope that you, you guys are doing okay in uh, Malaysia. Thank you very much for joining us. And last but not least, Ms. Bless, who hails to us from uh, sunny Philippines. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I am Blessed Vera, uh, Level 3 Information Systems Analyst of the Department of Information and Communications Technology. So I handle cloud government cloud operations for various stakeholders and government agencies in my country. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. So we have got people from all over ASEAN, ASEAN specific countries and people and, and especially for Dr. Lee has experience with uh, work within the actual development of the government cloud policy sphere and Bless is obviously working within the actual Gov, uh, Gov Cloud for the Philippines as well as the main. So really, really want to be hearing from them about where governments across ASEAN are recognizing the benefits of cloud, how uh, we're seeing the take up of cloud across ASEAN, not just within each individual country, but also writ large. So why don't why don't I uh, let uh, Kevin now flick over to the presentations that he that uh, the presentation slide that I know that he has going already. But I'd like to invite all of you who are listening. If you've got questions or discussions or uh, any anything, any comments that you want to make, whether they be funny or snide or you know spiky or anything, you can actually drop them into the chat box and we can have a quick chat about them. Because rather than waiting until the end of the session to run the uh, Q and A session, I'd really like to have a dialogue with you right from the start already. So we're going to start with at least the first question: uh, What are the key initiative programs being implemented that encourage cloud adoption? And this is where we're going to take a quick snapshot of the cloud de cloud deli uh, uh, cloud delivery mechanisms and cloud developments within each of the countries that we have here. So why don't we go in this order, Tsuming, Hingyan, Sisun, and then Bless, and we will be encouraging all of you who are in the audience, if you've got insights to share from your, your home country or insights to share, which are in locations not uh, from each of these uh, countries that we have uh, on the panel, then please do drop them in the notes and we can really start to compare notes. I think this is a nice classroom session. So without further ado, let me drop the mic and <laughs> hand it over to uh, Zuming for a Thanks. quick overview. A quick overview. 
So, is that okay? Okay. All right. Thanks, man. Okay, so um, Malaysia's cloud journey basically started off uh, about in, in 2018. Um, that's when we were proposing to the government that there needs to be a, a cloud first policy because we've, we've seen the UK adopt cloud uh, back from 2012 and we've seen Philippines adopt cloud from, uh, from 2014, I think it was. And we're saying that now it's time we started really seriously looking at the uh, public sector use of cloud. So the journey started in 2018. Um, obviously, at the time, the Malaysian government was totally unfamiliar with the cloud, and uh, it took two years to convince them that there is something uh, really, really interesting to, to consider. And there were so many issues that came up uh, that uh, included things like uh, uh, transmitting data offshore to a, uh, to a jurisdiction outside Malaysia, uh, they also had concerns about uh, obviously cyber security uh, security of data in the cloud uh, then things like uh, how do you decide which data can go to cloud and what which data cannot so we had to look into data classification and so on then also there was another issue of procurement process uh, the government is very used to procuring it solutions through a turnkey everything bundled into one package contract uh, whereas cloud with its uh, pay as you go model was uh, alien to the government and uh, and also as your workloads rise and fall throughout the year the total cost per year may be different right and so these are all the challenges that we really needed to to address um and so uh, i'm happy to say uh, to cut things short a bit is that uh, we actually had the cloud first policy officially adopted this year earlier this year uh, the government has also appointed four cloud service providers to a panel uh, of uh, what they call uh, approved service providers. And uh, happy to say that the top three cloud players in, in the world are actually on the panel. Uh, we also have a local player uh, in the form of Telecom Malaysia. Um, so I think it's well represented. I got to say personally, I was a little bit disappointed that they didn't open it up up completely and let more players in uh, but we understand that the government's plan eventually to open up the, the number of uh, players in the panel and uh, i think is the idea here is to, to have a slow start so that they can manage things and, and get the feel of it and eventually uh, i think once they figure out what what this is what cloud is all about and how we can uh, help the government and uh, control costs for example right and we are still continuing to work with the government. Uh, one of the other things we are working on in MDEC is to actually uh, upskill the IT team who are used to running a data center to people. That, so we need to get them ready for the cloud. Uh, and you know, it includes things like, for example, learning how to manage cost in the cloud. Uh, these are things that are important and cannot be uh, overlooked. Because we don't want them to have a situation where the cost spirals out of control and then they put a stop to it. So now we, we need to control it right from the beginning. I think that's a, a good introduction to what's happening in Malaysia right now. Thanks, Zuming. Yeah, I think that the, the developments are quite, uh, have, been, have been a long time coming. I know that we've discussed the cloud first policy uh, for quite a while. And I think that the, the need for a good uh, mechanism for training. I saw Miss Bless smiling there a little bit just now. <laughs> I think she also understands that she probably it, it. You always need good training and making sure that people understand. I didn't realize that that the training actually went down to the to level of cost management because I always thought that that was being handled by the financial controllers. But uh, I mean, I'd be I'd be very interested to hear uh, your opinion and compare a little bit with Miss Bless about what kind of roles are there that actually require that sort of budgeting uh that sort of budgeting skill set but pause pause on that thought again for those of you who are in the audience and, the, and watching and listening if you've got similar questions please just drop them into the chat function so that we can we can pick it up again later so that we don't forget all of this but let me turn now to Hing Yen uh to share a little bit about his opinion and his perspective on where we stand with regard to uh cloud adoption and the key initiatives not just in Singapore but I think also with an APEC regional perspective so Hing Yen over to you 
Sure. So, as I mentioned earlier, I started on cloud computing in Singapore way back in 2007. So that was a time when we can't even agree on whether there's cloud computing or not, whether what definition it goes to with. So it was very early days, but at that time it was quite clear to Singapore that cloud is the way to go, even though it might be a hype at that time, because for a number of strategic reasons. We realized that Singapore is a small country. We cannot afford land for every company to have their own data center. And we don't have any cheap source of uh, energy, which are used to power by data centers. And data centers are known to be a major consumer of energy. So it is very clear that at, from a strategic level, Singapore has to adopt cloud computing. The question is how at that early stage. It was clear that we have to take a holistic approach to, to manage this situation. So the idea is to how do we could build an ecosystem with the government leading the way as the main user. So it's very clear that government has to take the lead because if the government doesn't take the lead, the private sector would be wondering what the new, new, new technology is and what we should be doing about it. So we decided the government would go and adopt cloud for, its, for the least um, sensitive information. That is for information which is unclassified. So we so we begin the begin a journey of experimenting what how to use cloud so that we can get a hands dirty or feet dirty and on how do we can deal with the vendors. So at that time we were at that time to attract vendors to Singapore, even though they are all the data centers were outside a, APAC. We were, we we understood that um latency was an issue, some of the law uh, law uh, problem show stop, but so we know encourage them. But at that time, most of them say no. The world is out there. Wood Singapore is too small. So we did what we need to do. We seeded our own cloud service providers through our own open con company to show that there was demand from Singapore and not only Singapore, there's usage. So this this first attempt to get usage going caught the attention of the major providers. So eventually they came to Singapore to sell data centers there as well, because they know that they are serious intent on the government to to tackle this issue. So I will tackle the other issues um, that Singapore went along the way, but Singapore government went from the non unclassified information went to more sensitive information over time. So today we are putting more the restricted type of information on the cloud and also it moves from um, moving classified information from um, uh, community cloud to increasingly using public cloud. So that is a movement and early days Cloud usage tend to be for new systems, so that it's easier. So old systems were harder to move legacy system in a lift and shift manner. Today, we have the government is slowly moving legacy system to the cloud using cloud native approach. So I'll stop here for now. Thanks, Hing Yan. Thanks for that retrospective of, of uh, where we stood with Singapore. I like your, your point, your last point that you made, that you mentioned that legacy systems are actually a little bit harder to shift and that use case has to be developed. So I, I think that indeed to answer my own question about what are some of the key initiatives and policies that are being implemented to encourage cloud adoption? Yes, we obviously need cloud first policy, but here we see in instances where I think the lift and shift policy is not, it's not, it wasn't so easy to do last time than it is right now, or at least wasn't as easy. It, it wasn't, it isn't as easy to get the permission, I guess, to get the approval to move it uh, right now. So thank you. Thank you for that. Indeed, we will come back to all of the other points, which I know I can see the, the threats coming already. I can see uh, we're going to come back to those points a little bit later. But let me hand the time now to Sassoon to give us his perspective on where some of the initiatives and policies uh, has been have been throughout Asia Pacific. This is over to you. Thanks, thanks, man. And um, you know, we're talking about cloud. Um, you know, it's just it's extraordinary where we've seen cloud progress in the last twenty years or so. I mean, Salesforce was formed in nineteen ninety nine, and it was a cloud based company since its inception. Now, at the time that when that was the case, that was quite peculiar because you know people, some companies were still providing software on disks and and what have you. So we've seen an enormous transformation in cloud, and you know in fact, according to McKinsey, by 2024, most enterprises aspire to have eight of every ten dollars for IT hosting going towards the cloud. So it's really important 
um, for governments and, and others alike when they're developing policies, policies for cloud adoption to be very cognizant of, of that major shift that's going on at the moment. Um, and of course, where we're seeing cloud um, being very helpful for increasing productivity, um, accelerating innovation, and you know, the cloud also gives you the opportunity to have the latest software with the latest updates very secure, um, all available in real time. Um, to have um, policies to encourage cloud adoption, I think there are four main ingredients that need to be looked at. Firstly, um, there needs to be policies that help um, promote cloud infrastructure and connectivity. You know, having connectivity important. I, I've, you know, even a few calls I've made during this week, my connection has been not not been 100% because of the, of the usage within my own household. So connectivity is very important. Secondly, it's uh, cloud security. Um, thirdly, cloud regulation and balancing both the security and privacy aspects when it comes to regulating cloud. And finally, I, I, I would um, make the point of having cloud skills and literacy. So knowing what cloud is, how to use it, and um, making sure people are able to use it effectively. Um, across ASEAN, we've seen a number of different policies to help with the adoption of cloud. Um, my colleague at MDEC mentioned cloud-first policies, which Malaysia has adopted for so as Singapore and the Philippines. And that, that, that's, that's an important policy lever that, that can be used for cloud adoption. And not just only having that as a policy lever, but um, you know, making sure it's effectively implemented as well. Um, you know, in, in some instances, government agencies have gone as far as making the use of public cloud services as their default. Um, another area to consider, I think, is very important for governments, um, given the prevalence of small businesses across ASEAN, you know, more than 90% of businesses across ASEAN are small businesses, is to ensure that there are policies in place to help SMEs be able to adopt digital. Now, why is this important? Well, you know, SMEs need to have digital, which is connected to the cloud, to be able to transact through e-commerce, uh, whether there's processing e-invoices, using customer relationship management systems, processing payments, all supported through the cloud. So I think these are, these are some important policy areas that can further promote cloud adoption. But um, you know, it's always changing. It's, it's a space that is never consistent. And I, I think you know, it's always being important to always refining policies to, to continue to encourage that level of adoption. Thanks, Asun. I, I do share your observations that indeed the, there are a number of countries who ha which have already put in place some of these pro-cloud policies. I also want to note that I believe that a number of countries such as the Philippines, such as Australia as well, which although not part of ASEAN, is part of the broader Asia-Pacific community, have actually iterated their policies. It used to be, I believe, cloud first within Australia, and now it's called the secure cloud policy. And I do think that in the Philippines, um, and Ms. Bless can probably uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that it used to be the, the cloud first policy from 2017. And now I don't know if there is an up, uh, that if there's a new name, but I do know it was updated. Was it earlier last year or was it earlier two years ago? Could you correct? Oh, it's your turn to speak anyway, so you might as well. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can unmute yourself and chat with, with us. Yeah, so um, before going to the cloud, the amended cloud first policy, um, let me um, start the conversation by stating that the Department of Information and Communications Technology of the Republic of the Philippines is one of the youngest executive branches of the country. So recently, last June, it commemorated its fifth anniversary and it launched its strategic framework for the country's readiness for global digital economy. It's actually called the CHIP Strategic Framework, CHIP. So I'm not going to dwell on the other components, but let me walk you through the CONNECT component or the letter C. So uh, C stands for CONNECT because uh, this is for uh, the component of strategic component for digital transformation. 
So what it aims to do is to establish or um, to strengthen the core or foundation of digital transformation in the Philippines, especially during the pandemic. A uh, part of the digital infrastructure plan of the country is actually to establish a dedicated cloud region within the Philippines. So what does this mean? Um, this means that um, cloud service providers can take their um, their hardware or they can bring their own infrastructure to DACT uh, data centers. So the but the infrastructure will be for exclusive use of the Philippine government. Aside from that, uh, this also means that uh, government agencies, both local and national, can locally host and reside their data within the Philippine premise. So uh, this will address issues on data residency and uh, data latency. So going back to the cloud first policy, yes, it was uh, crafted uh, 2017, but was amended last year, uh, June 2020. And it seeks to clarify the policy coverage, uh, data classification, data security, data sovereignty, uh, data residency, as well as data ownership. Thanks, Bless, for that. Indeed, it's uh, definitely a good good uh, update on the CHIP strategic framework. Uh, can I encourage you, if you have the CHIP strategic framework link, to please uh, drop the link into the chat box. And Zeming, also, if you have the link for uh, the Malaysia Cloud First policy, please do drop it into the chat box so that everyone can have a look at it. Thank you, Richard Darling, for um, for your question. Just it, it segues very neatly into our next question, which is going to be on the outlook for cross-border transfers. Um, he's asked a question around the concept of multi-cloud, which he says has the potential to address policy concerns around vendor lock-in, data sovereignty, and security. And I think that those, those that hits uh, a lot of the, the the good spots, I guess, if, you, if you're looking at um, talking about cloud computing. It hits a lot of the core important concepts that we should be talking about when it, co when it comes to cross-border transfers. So um, I'm going to get Sisun, Hingyan, Zeming, and then Bless to, to comment if you've got any comments on multi-cloud in the first instance, but also to ask you about what do you think the outlook is in the context of this question as well. What's the context, uh, sorry, what is the outlook for cross-border transfers throughout the region? Are we are we looking more towards regulatory convergence, divergence? Uh, how will it impact cloud adoption? How will new concepts like the concept of multi-cloud, like what Richard mentioned, how is that going to impact um, the way that we are looking at cloud and gov cloud, for example? So. Can I hand the time to Sassoon first to, to give his opinion about this? Yeah, thanks, Mayan, um, and thanks for the question. Yeah, we've got multi-cloud, we've got multi-tenanted cloud, we've got hybrid cloud, we've got public cloud, we've got private cloud. So we've got a number of different solutions that um, are available to be used um, the way we use cloud. Um, let me, let me um, go to the um, original question and then come back to that. So it, I think one of the... Uh, qu questions or challenges is, is, you know, is there a convergence or a divergence of regulatory issues in, in ASEAN when it comes to, you know, cross-border border data? I think there's actually both. Um, so th there's divergence in the sense that increasingly countries are seeking um, the notion of data sovereignty of having them being able to choose which data, what type of data they would like to be hosted in market. Um, there's also the notions of, in some instances, data classification, where some countries are classifying more sensitive data that needs to be hosted locally. Um, and then you have um, countries in, in, um, in ASEAN, for example, Indonesia with its GR71 proposal, or Vietnam with its uh, uh, Decree 72, which is imposing um, certain additional data localization requirements. So that's the kind of divergence. But if we look at con uh, convergence and some of the policies where um, there are potential opp opportunities for increased cooperation. Um, I mean, you can look to Singapore. So Singapore has led initiatives in the ASEAN Data Management Framework and the ASEAN model 
contractual clauses for cross-border data flows. And this has been set up to actually help with the free flow of data among ASEAN countries. Uh, we're seeing the development of the Comprehensive Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. You have Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam in that, um, in terms of the ASEAN markets. Granted, there are some caveats in that, in that agreement, but that gives an opportunity for further convergent opportunities. And the other convergent opportunity, I think, is if it's taken up, is if, if countries uh, take up the opportunity to set up bilateral agreements in digital economy agreements. So we have seen some countries establish digital economy agreements, as Singapore, Australia is an example of that, where there are specific provisions um, in relation to cross-border data flows. So I, I think this is the um, thing, but I think it all comes down to is that uh, in terms of cross-border data flows and in terms of cloud, it all comes down to the data. What is the type of data that we're talking about and making sure it's a very uh, defined notion of what that data is. And then from that, you can then, I think, manage the reg regulatory issues around that. Thanks, Susun. I think that, that that encouragement for governments to work on um, both bilateral as well as multilateral agreements is definitely the, the way to go. Um, I do think that there are uh, approaches such as multi-cloud, which do have the potential, as Richard mentioned, to address some of the policy concerns, uh, definitely can be can play a part there. Uh, but let me go to Hing Yen to see his his opinion first before we start talking about the actual technology of multi-cloud, because I think I suspect Hing Yen, Zuming, and Bless might actually have a more detailed, uh, well, more in-depth insight into the concept of multi-cloud and how it can be deployed. Hing Yen. Okay, so. Um... We, I've been with uh, Cloud Security Alliance for some time, and we continue to support our users uh, in every part of the world, given that different type of legislation they have, data protection or data prote uh, cloud security prote uh, issues. So our solution so far in working with all our partners and cloud users is to take um, a cloud security standard and then map it to the respective countries' requirement. So for example, let me use an example from CSA with a STAR for certifying cloud services, and a number of cloud services have been certified using STAR. But for STAR to work, for example, in Malaysia, MTech, for example, has done the mapping for STAR security controls to the MTEC, uh, to the Malaysian Data Protection Act, so that any cloud service providers that is STAR certified can also fulfill the data protection requirements in Malaysia. So that makes it easy for service providers that's been certified to some international standards to be able to easily meet the requirement of that country because we ex accept that every country would have their right to modify the data protection rights and whatever national security laws they want. The question is how to map it and make it workable, especially easy for the cloud service user, consumer, as well as the easy for cloud service provider. So we have done that for security standards. We have mapped start to MTCS, we map start to 27,001, we have map um, um, start to MDEC MPDPA, and Malaysia PDPA, and we've done it for HIPAA and other countries. So that is one short term way of handling, short of the countries coming together and agree on a common uh, yes thing. Thanks, Hingyan. Indeed, the, the standards are, <laughs> I think, the, the core thing for us to be ensuring interoperability and uh, the ability to, to talk to each other in, in, various, um, in various jurisdictions, especially when there aren't any regulatory models in place already. And it's interesting that you're talking about mapping everything because I see that Zuming does have uh, the submarine cable map behind him as a, as a virtual background. <laughs> Simi, what, what do you think? What's happening in Malaysia? Do you think that this uh, the cross-border data transfer situation, how, how is it going um, and how is Malaysia addressing it? And is, is multi-cloud a solution? Simi, you're on mute. This is a, this is a problem that uh, <laughs> you forget to unmute yourself. Okay, basically in, in Malaysia, what we are looking at here now is that while we do not have any general restrictions on cross-border transfers, right, which is a really good thing, 
Uh, we are hoping that the government will continue to practice that policy. There are some specific areas where uh, there is some uh, uh, concern. One of them is the central bank. So central bank is still looking into this. Uh, I don't think they have uh, any, there's no rule that says no, you can't do it. Uh, but the banks do need to go to the central bank and uh, explain how the how the solution is going to work uh, in order for the central bank to whether to say agree or not. So I think that's uh, I, again it's early days yet for Malaysia. So I think they are they are getting a feel for how things going to work, and uh, some of the banks are starting to initiate projects. And I think let let's see how that goes. On the government side, um, there is a very clear uh, what you call it resistance against uh, putting what they call classified data outside uh, Malaysian borders. Okay, um, We have been pushing for them to relax that a bit. So, so, I mean, for example, top secret and secret, fine. You know, leave it in, uh, in the onshore data center, right? But uh, there, there is no restriction for unclassified data, but there is a debate on what they call, what they say is uh, uh, confidential and restricted data. And we are saying that you know, if if the banks can put financial data on, on the cloud, right? So why can't confidential and uh, restricted data be put on the on the cloud as well? So that's an ongoing discussion. There's, uh, there's going to be a workshop that's led by the Ministry of Communications and Multimedia on, on data classification. Uh, and we hope that each ministry will make its own decision on, on how to classify the data. I think that's the that's the way it's going to go. Each ministry will need to figure out what they are comfortable with. So there's no overall rule that says, okay, this kind of data is, is considered uh, confidential or restricted. Uh, it, it's in the hands of each ministry. So for example, Ministry of Health with, with the COVID uh, pandemic and the need to get uh, information out to the public as quickly and as efficiently as possible needed to use the cloud. So they had to relax the rules on how to handle uh, data on the cloud. Right? So that's, that's a good example. Uh, for as far as multi-cloud is concerned, I think um, MDEC's own uh, experience is that we, we had to go to multi-cloud. We were actually on three different cloud platforms right now. And we found that, uh, I mean, just, just for a little bit of info, the easiest things to move when we first started the journey like uh, three years ago was anything that belonged to Microsoft, we can move it to a Microsoft-based cloud, right? So we, we were using uh, Exchange for email. So going to Exchange on the cloud was a no-brainer. It was just uh, it was an easy thing to do. We were using other Microsoft tools like Dynamics and so on. That, that went to the cloud easily as well. Then we found that uh, developing new applications for uh, internal use was more efficient and more uh, productive when we use uh, Amazon Web Services. So we, we ended up with a lot of stuff on AWS. And then uh, there are some, we were doing projects with some government agencies that insisted that data had to be onshore. Uh, so we used Alibaba because Alibaba has established a data center in, in, in Malaysia. Right, so that that's the way we work. So it's uh, multi-cloud in the way of what workload goes where. So we are we are not to the point where we are looking at multi-cloud where uh, one application uses multiple cloud platforms to deliver its service. Right. Uh, so that that's not quite there yet. So it's not it's everything on one platform. Uh, and we might add a third, a fourth platform soon as well because we are seeing there. The, for example, Google's analytics tools and stuff like that, that, that looks really interesting. We might be uh, considering using uh, Google for those kinds of workloads. All right. So I think that's that's the Malaysia uh, situation in a nutshell. Yeah. Thanks, Zuming. I think that the Malaysia situation, as you call it, isn't exactly uh, alien to a lot of people who are probably listening in as well, because I have heard that indeed that's usually the cloud journey 
that people are taking. Like, what's easy? What can be moved? The same brand, okay. If the same brand can go, to the same brand will <laughs> just move it in the first instance. And that, and I do think that the there is a risk right now to to Richard's question. You know, is the concept does it have the potential to address some of the policy concerns? I think that yes, I think it does have uh, the con the the possibility of addressing uh, vendor lock in because from a risk management perspective, no eggs, no all the eggs in one basket, right? You want to put them in a couple of multiple baskets. But in terms of uh, ensuring better security in terms of control mechanisms, then yes, shifting the entire workload from one uh, on-prem to somewhere else and having another uh, having another workload pu pushed to another bread vendor, uh, completely having completely separate controls might actually be good in some respects, but also might not be good in some other respects. So to give you an example, when you were sharing a little bit about the um, that each ministry you mentioned, each ministry therefore has to decide what it can tolerate in terms of risk management. I mean, there is a risk there, therefore, that fragmentation of policies is going to happen. It's not going to be an easy, oh, multi-cloud is a yes. I think multi-cloud as a, as a concept is probably a yes uh, for addressing, uh, for example, vendor lock-in, but it probably is going to be a question of like, what security levels you're going to be at? And this is where I think we'll turn back to Hing Yen and ask him, like, oh, you know, what's the mapping of this security standard against this security standard? And uh, possibly, uh, very highly possibly, and this is where I'll, I'll get Miss Bless to step in and, and, and share her perspective, very possibly there'll be a discussion around uh, interoperability with other departments because there's going to be a need for data sharing between, especially for government, government departments. So it might not just be uh, the need to address risk concerns, but also interoperability for, for usability's sake and for functionality's sake. And I'm just wondering, Ms. Bless, from your experience with uh, GovCloud in the Philippines, I mean, how's, how are you seeing that? Is, is multi-cloud one of the concepts that is being put in place and, and being looked upon favorably when it comes to cross-border transfers across ASEAN or with, even within the, a single government? Uh, within the Philippines. Yeah, so uh, the uh, CAN model contractual clauses was mentioned a while ago, uh, but the, our department of, or the department of ICT thinks that this is a welcome effort towards harmonization of data management standards and cross-borders data transfer, especially for the ASEAN region. But uh, right now, it's still optional. It's not mandatory. But we think it is a great step towards regulatory convergence. And uh, um, just this uh, June, this year, the National Privacy Commission of the Philippines issued an advisory on the use of MCC and the data management framework. So the advisory serves as a supplement to the MCC and data management framework, uh, which essentially apply, uh, implies that the promotion and recognition of their value domestically in the Philippines. Uh, it's not mandatory, but while it's considered voluntary in nature, uh, in the Philippines through the National Privacy Commission. Uh, the National Privacy Commission has been explicitly stating that companies in the Philippines who adopt the ASEAN MCC and the data management framework are considered to be compliant with the Section 21 of the Philippines Data Privacy Act of 2012. Uh, on the issue whether the regulatory convergence will facilitate cloud adoption, we agree totally because we recognize that among the inhibitors or barriers for cloud adoption, uh, there are data security issues, uh, data security concerns, and data localization. Um, which most part are put in place as data security measures. So uh, having this set of standards in place, uh, they can be known and recognized as they would foster uh, trust among parties regardless of jurisdiction and the data would have comparable level of protection as in their own respective countries. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Bless. Indeed, the, a lot of the frameworks that have been coming up, I think that the the model contractual clauses uh, document for ASEAN has been quite a 
a positive step forward for everybody's given a lot of people reassurance that okay even if our frameworks are not really in place at least we have this we can fill it in and we can submit it to be compliant i think that's what making everybody a little bit nervous to ensure that we're compliant and i know errol uh errol muya has uh has asked for some comments uh what's happening with cloud use in other asian nations like laos in cambodia myanmar and in vietnam i think that we do have uh, people in the audience, I think I, I do see, let's see, Mike uh, Mike is online and we have other people uh, who are also definitely looking at uh, ASEAN and other A Asian countries like myself. Um, let's see who else is online. Got lo lots of people who I de definitely know are following ASEAN as well. So if you feel like you want to be answering Errol's question, uh, please do drop your, your comment into the chat as well. For myself, I do know that Myanmar, for example, has been definitely developing, uh, well, before the events of last year happened, uh, they were developing uh, data centers. I do know that there was one that was planned already in Napidor. I think that that was, I think that they had a connection with HP, but I might have been wrong. I know that AWS also was very keen on developing in Myanmar um, as well as Microsoft. So there were, there, there have been some discussions already. I do know that the government itself had a, a, a data center <laughs> that um, I, I don't know whether it's a data center, but I, I don't think it's a data center. You, you, I think you'd call it a, a set of server racks that I happened to be working beside when I was uh, in Napidor. But that's definitely something that was on their radar about a, a, a year or two ago. Uh, Vietnam accelerating extremely rapidly within cloud the cloud use and uh, gov cloud definitely. Uh, with under the auspices of the new prime minister, a lot of the digital transformation work has really been accelerating a lot. And I know a lot of the government civil service are, are quite um, stressed out, <laughs> to say the least, by a lot of the acceleration. So definitely moving. Um, and I think that places like Laos um, and um, the and Cambodia as well, very happy to be receiving, as Bless mentioned, the documentation which is coming out of ASEAN to uh, ensure regional that all boats rise with the increasing tide. It really comes um, as a helpful guide to people who are don't have that, that much capacity to develop these frameworks themselves. So it's all it's all looking quite positive. It's only a, the state of uh, the adoption on the ground. And this is where I come back to where Sassoon was mentioning earlier, which I, I want to pick up the idea that the small and medium enterprises, I think, really need a lot of assistance when it comes to taking up cloud computing, because I think that the capacity, the, the competing uh, competing requirements of running a business often come into play. And that's where um, it is a challenge for some of the governments to uh, successfully operationalize and, and deploy the cloud. So which brings me actually to my third question. Uh, what are some of the challenges that all of you see that governments face in the successful operationalization and development and deployment of cloud? Uh, not just for GovCloud, of course, but also for encouraging the industry uh, uptake of cloud computing. And let's go with uh, in the sequence Hingyan, Zeming, Sisun, and then Bless. So Hingyan, what do you what do you what do you think are some of the challenges that you've observed within ASEAN within uh, within the countries that you've experienced the deployment of cloud? What what are some of the challenges that governments have actually face? So my some of my observations are uh, whether they are competent, experienced people that can work with them to in to move cloud systems either to build if you're building systems from scratch or to move the legacy system to the cloud. So whether they're qualified people and whether these people are trained properly. So it is almost uh, every evident, even in the recent pandemic situation, when a lot of companies move to the cloud, pivot to the cloud, it's very clear that they need to pivot to the cloud, but they don't. They can't find people who are qualified, can help them build system, and even to build um, secure system. So now that into this uh, almost post pandemic situation, they have they have to relook at all the thing, the work they've done, how the cloud they've built, and whether these cloud systems they've built have undergone due diligence and whether they are actually secured and well secured against a potential attack by cyber criminals. So that is has always been a problem in terms of the right uh, type of people, the professionals 
who are competent to help you to build a cloud. The other lessons they will need is, especially in specialized domain, for example, in banking, if you want to adopt uh, cloud in banking, most of the countries in ASEAN look to uh, the West who have gone that, down that journey to learn the best practices and lessons. This is where I think the uh, service providers, service providers can help to bring about those best practices and stories to educate uh, the regulators in this part of the world to understand why their counterparts in other countries have gone that, that route. Because there are always some in, uh, fear of some regulatory in nature which they have not uh, addressed or overcome, which they can learn. So I would always think it's useful for the vendors to actually share some of these lessons because it's not at the operational level that people don't understand, so they're, they're fearful. But at the top level, they'll be wondering how come my counterparts in other countries are doing that and why do I not do it? Why are my, my people so fearful? So they need to be able to bridge that gap of understanding. Because the people on top, the regulars are not stupid, they are smart people, but they always want to know why are they doing it and why my, my staff are advising me otherwise. So I think this is what uh, vendors and solution providers can help the, the governments to move forward. Back to you. Thank, yeah. Thanks, Hing Yen. Indeed, the, the work that I think learning from other people is always really, really core. Uh, and I think that that's something which is hopefully can help us uh, address some of the challenges. Uh, Joshua, I saw your hand. Thank you very much for it. I'm going to give Zuming Sassoon and bless the, the, the time to share the insights on the challenges first uh, before coming back to you. So don't worry, I will absolutely come back to you on, on, on your hand up. But Zuming, what do you think are some of the challenges? And maybe I should ask you, what are the problems that you face, you know, rather than what are the challenges that governments, what are the problems that you face? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I think I, it would be probably best if I, I uh, share MDEX own uh, uh, what call it, challenges when we, we basically made a move to cloud, right? Um, we <clears throat> we went from having our own server closet to a third party data center and eventually you know, at the end of 2019, we went 100% on the cloud. So we've got nothing in the data center anymore uh, besides, uh, besides what's on the cloud, right? Uh, so the problem was, <clears throat> Uh, we had people who were very familiar with having taking care of uh, servers, right? Uh, but when you went to outsource data center, they were, they, they basically learned to work remotely. So that was <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> that was a good move because once you learn to work remotely, then when when we did move to the cloud, right, it was uh, it, it was a smoother transition. Okay, uh, and the the thing is. <coughs> We still need because we have an outsourced IT operations, right? We, we have a very small IT team, and we basically outsource uh, to a vendor. But the vendor <coughs> pros an, a very interesting challenge because we have three cloud platforms. There were very very few vendors out there who could end, handle all three competently, right? So when we when we were looking for a managed service provider to help us take care of uh, of the, the cloud platforms, uh, we could find some with uh, very good experience with one platform and one or two with uh, dual platform. And when we, and nobody was actually prepared to handle three different cloud platforms. So that was a major challenge. And we ended up just hiring someone with two platforms and they learned the third platform on the job. <laughs> so we became a training ground for these guys. Right? And <clears throat> At the end, at the end of their contract after two years, they basically were the only company who could handle three clouds. <laughs> <laughs> you you created your own uh, your own uh, procurement yeah. nightmare. <laughs> and they they immediately realized their value, and when it came to renewing the contract, the price doubled, and we were like, whoa, what happened here? <laughs> <laughs> so we, okay. we, we, were, we actually we were forced to look for a, a, a replacement vendor because. You know, we budgeted to pay these guys more or less the same thing. And when they doubled the price to us, we, we couldn't take them anymore. So we had to find someone else and uh, <laughs> repeat the entire process all over again. So well, it I... is definitely a, 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 a basically a, a skills challenge. The ability, I mean, I, I, whoever's listening out there, this is an opportunity. <laughs> if you are if you are multi cloud skilled, you have a huge value. <laughs> okay, so I think that's that's the experience. We the biggest 
challenge we had. We, we didn't have the in-house capability to do it. And when we went to the market, they didn't have it either. <laughs> so that, that was a, a, a tough situation we had to go through and we, we became the training ground. So we we had to have, uh, what do you call it? Uh, we had to be a little bit more flexible on, on allowing them to like figure things out on their own uh, you know, as, as we went along. So it became a journey for both MDEC plus our support vendor as well. So I think that this comes back to where Hing Yen was mentioning. We have to learn from learn from others with case studies. So this is a yeah. good case study to be learning from. So soon, would you agree that I think training is the is a, a big challenge for for governments and as well as for uh, the private sector when it comes to cloud adoption? Yeah, I think Zee Ming um, raised some very good points. I I also agree with his earlier comment about this notion of interoperability, given the you know different cloud uh, providers he had to deal with. But um, you know, interoperability is, is, is a challenge. Um, you know, digital skills is a significant challenge. We're seeing this uh, even among our um, ecosystem. Uh, we've got a huge demand, um, uh, not only having digital skills within our own company, but our partner ecosystem, who are the system integrators, or you know, manage services who integrate software to customers and governments as well. So there's a huge gap there. Um, there's also, I think, a digital skills gap within government as well, how to best leverage the technology, how to customize it internally, how to understand the system and make full use of that technology um, within in-house as well. So I think it's both a managed services issue, which Zeming highlight, but also can be internal as well. Um, I guess one of the other, the other, any other challenge I, I mentioned is maybe less of an issue now, but more, probably was more of an issue before, um, was this notion of risk. Um, no um, government agency wants to be the first to use a particular type of, say, uh, cloud platform. If that's if that's the word you want to use um, and uh, in some instances uh, people would rather stick to what they know rather than doing something new so in those instances where that, where that transformational shift is occurring um, there might be an element of risk that's being managed particularly if it's not if it hasn't been done elsewhere among peers in, in that particular setting or that jurisdiction Thanks, Susun. That's definitely something which uh, everyone should be definitely aware of. Uh, Miss Bless, uh, you're you're the final one to give an opinion about the challenges that our, our governments face in cloud adoption. So, what is your uh, perspective on this from the Philippines? Yeah, so they pretty much stated everything, uh, every challenges that we are facing in the Philippines. But let me just um, dwell on the procurement policy. So in the Philippines, we don't have a standard uh, guidelines for procurement of ICT services, specifically for cloud. So, but it's a good news that, that our department is uh, in constant uh, coordination with the government procurement policy. Uh, board to create the guidelines because yeah interoperability is a big challenge because migrating from one um, provider to another it's a very tedious task especially for cloud admins and I also agree that skills and competency is a challenge because not everyone in the public sector is equipped with the right skill sets so the ICT capacity building and planning should also be considered and lastly, uh, we have an issue when it comes to cloud hesitancy because not everyone uh, wants to migrate to the cloud because of legacy systems. And they also have a huge issue when it comes to cloud security, although it is to be noted that cloud security is a shared responsibility. Thanks, Bless. You definitely um, have really good perspective there, given that you're actually touching and feeling and working uh, GovCloud for the Philippines. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to get you to unmute Joshua so that Joshua can join us and, and ask his question. Joshua. Uh, hi, hi, man. Uh, hi. Thanks. Thank, well, 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 thanks for muting me. Um, I, I just wanted to, to seek the thoughts of uh, 
uh, our esteemed panelists, uh, we have different sorts of clouds. They have their own nuances. The CASPs are different. The taxonomies are different. The service offerings are different. Uh, even the way they throttle bandwidth on the intranet, vastly different. Ingress, egress, all different. So granted, these are all very different animals being placed together to serve a, a common customer. I, I, that's 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 my impression of what's happening, and and so we're going for the lowest common denominator. So I've heard about training, I've heard about the need to have strategy, but I'm just thinking out loud. Strategy aside, training aside, uh, is do we do we need to do we need to identify what are some of the common building blocks that cascade across these clouds? And by clouds, you know, I'm, I'm using a very vague term uh, so that we identify what are the building blocks which are common across the five or the six or the seven of them and say, when I want storage, this is what I have. This is the lowest common denominator. I, I know someone has AI, someone has TPU, someone has some other stuff. But is, is that a necessary step in order for us to have a, a common cloud policy? Or is this something that we we live with and we organically grow in terms of maturity of how to deal with the differences between these few clouds. And I guess the 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 the, the desired goal is that one day I, I may put something in Tencent cloud and six weeks down the road, I change my mind, I take it out, I put it in Huawei cloud, I change my mind, I take it out, I can put it in in uh, Azure and then I take it out. Of, of course, in reality, it's not easy because there are a lot of strings which tie them to each of the incumbents. Like if I'm using data, Databricks, and, and because I'm using Databricks, you know, I've already done it in a certain way where it's not easy to divorce the data from the platform because the data has been arranged in a certain manner. So I, I don't know, and, and I would love to hear, especially from the public sector perspective, is this simply a challenge that we grapple with as we go along uh, or is it something that needs to be done before we then agree that we can have greater adoption of of the public cloud thanks joshua all right open open discussion to answer joshua's pretty interesting perspective on how we go <laughs> zooming has a yeah. thanks zooming also for addressing john's question uh on the chat uh, uh if hing yen and sisun and uh, bless would like to do that as well but zooming over to you okay all right i think uh, the the most important thing is to identify the platform that best fits the purpose so like like the way we did it um obviously moving our email from an exchange server in the data center to exchange running on, on uh, microsoft's cloud right is uh, you know, that's the easy thing to do but it, it obviously is not going to be the same for everything else um it, now the thing is each cloud platform has its strengths and weaknesses and i, I think you you need to look at uh, you cannot look at uh, holistically throughout your entire uh, IT uh, infrastructure and say, OK, which cloud are we going to move everything to? It, I don't think it's going to work that way. You need to look at which applications will fit be best on which cloud platform. So if you are going to do something that has a lot of analytics and AI requirements, then you know maybe Google might be the, the top of your list there and you use whatever infrastructure that they happen to have with them. Um, so uh, you probably don't want to straddle your application over multiple cloud platforms that way. So you don't want to have your analytics sitting on Google, but the storage is on uh, AWS. You know, I mean, uh, that, that's going to uh, basically destroy your cost control because you're moving data in and out of, the, of the, the storage systems rather than keeping it within the cloud platform, right? So I think if anything you do not want to have data being migrated from one cloud to another on a daily basis that is that that's crazy basically so the data needs to go to where the application is now i think a lot of things can work if you are looking at very generic type of applications like web servers right so if you are looking at de uh, deploying web servers and you're looking for which platform can give you the best uh, bang for the buck basically so this is just purely you know, handling high traffic web servers, then you might want to say, okay, which is the best? And you might even want to look at which is the best this month 
and uh, you might be able because moving web servers from one place to another might be a bit easier. But uh, monolithic applications like financial systems and all this kind of thing that you, you need to see basically where the best fit is going to be. So uh, don't look at your IT infrastructure as a monolithic thing. Chop it up into bits that uh, that make sense to put into different places and manage it that way. I think sure. I, again, that's our experience, right? It may not work uh, for everyone. That's the way it, uh, we have sure. done it. Uh, so go ahead. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure that we we did have uh, spend some time uh, letting the other participants also sorry letting the other uh, panelists also respond to that. Would uh, Hingyan, uh, Bless, or Sasun have anything to add as well? Let me uh, just chime in quickly. I, I think given the state of cloud technology, things move very fast. A lot of changes. So to expect a particular way of looking at cloud services is pretty restrictive because it, it doesn't allow for innovation to happen. Because whatever we know about cloud today has changed very quickly over time. So even within a single cloud service providers, as we know, you go for training, you look at the training materials. The training materials are very different from the actual system itself because I've changed the system since the training materials are produced. So it's quite that we are actually catching up with a lot of things. So the, the rate of technology changes so fast that I think it's hard to expect a certain way of looking at cloud services. That's my uh, view of things. Thanks. Bless and Sasun? I was just very brief. I was going to mention that um, a lot of these companies have to ad adhere to certain international standards and ISO settings. So there is an opportunity there if um, by by the organizational companies adhering to consistent standards, um, that could be a mechanism to address that issue that, that was asked. Thanks, Susan. And bless any any opinions about how how we should be integrating everything or not. <laughs> yeah, it can be considered, but for the Philippine settings, uh, we're following the cloud first policy, so we strictly follow the data classification. So highly sensitive data should not be uh, deployed on public cloud. It should be on a private cloud. So that's my uh, opinion on the matter. Thank you. Mm, all right. Thank you very much, Joshua. I'm sorry I, I had to mute you, but we're we're out of time, so I wanted to give all the participants um, an opportunity to to round up. And I, I think that uh, if you want, if you want, we can obviously uh, connect you via email to our participants, our speakers, obviously to continue the conversation. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to be consolidating the way that we we manage and and do cloud. I don't think that we're in a position at this point. I think everybody still. Coming, coming up the learning curve, coming up the skills curve, coming up the understanding of what roles are needed, testing out, learning from other people. There's so much to be doing, so much still yet to be done and learn about the various aspects and the various ways in which we can architect and have all of these different systems talk to each other that I don't think that we're in a position where we can say, okay, can we, can we make it more efficient right now? I think right now we're not quite there just yet, at least not within the within within ASEAN. I'm going to give uh, our, our panelists a last uh, a roundup opportunity to to say uh, to give their opinions about where you, they think that the uh, government and the private sector can be working together to be accelerating cloud adoption in the in Asia Pacific. And uh, let me go in, the, in this sequence, Hingyan, Sisun, Ziming, and then Bless. Well, I think more discussion is needed, especially you were talk, for example, in the area of data sovereignty. So, so it's clearly an issue that cross borders. So the government should be talking to each other, especially with potential good benefits to the cloud users themselves. Because so data sovereignty hits the cloud users the most. It's not just the cloud, but not, 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 not just the cloud service providers, but it's the cloud users because they have to decide how to architect the systems, whether it's on one cloud or the other cloud, subject to whatever regulations the government impose on them. So that there needs to be more discussion, understanding what are the motivations between some of the, the rules they put in place so that the users are least impacted. So that's my five cents worth. Worth more than five cents, thank you. Thanks. So soon? Um, I'm going to say digital skills, the opportunity between the government and the private sector to work together 
to address and unlock the digital skills gap will have a significant um, benefit to boosting cloud adoption because that's going to be a critical requirement and need to unlocking further adoption both within government and also within the private sector. Thanks. That definitely seems to be a trend and, and which I personally am very much on, on board with. Definitely skills is a massive uh, way in which both private and public sector can be working together and is very, very much needed. Zeming. Yes, I, I'm going to echo both of the other speakers. I think uh, it's definitely something that, but what I'll add uh, uh, on top of that is that uh, in, in order for governments to be more um, comfortable with the cloud, I think they have to start uh, deep diving into a, a lot of other mechanisms as well, you know, not just uh, data classification and, and the issue of data sovereignty, but I think uh, one of the things that I think you know that we have been working on is actually just as law enforcement uh, access as well, right? I think one of the issues with uh, law enforcement access is that a lot of governments are fearful that if the, the data is in a foreign jurisdiction, then that jurisdiction has uh, access rights to the data. I think that's that's the, the thing that needs to be addressed. And I think once governments realize that that's not actually the case and there has to be a lot of other uh, a, a proper process for law enforcement access, then uh, I think that will be that will bring more comfort to governments to say, okay, I'm, I'm fine having my my data hosted in a different country. Yeah. I think a lot of governments are quite nervous about the, by right, it should be like this, but by left, it's like this, right? So <laughs> what's right and what's left, <laughs> it's a little it, bit of a... Yeah, uh, there's a lot of misconception about the US Cloud Act. And I think the fear is that the Cloud Act gives US government uh, inordinate amount of access to the data is one of the biggest uh, things that needs to be addressed. <laughs> Definitely. Thanks, Zuming, for that. Yeah. Les, last final thoughts from you. Uh, the Department of ICT is currently working on a cloud tech, uh, cloud computing technical assistance. It's a grant funded by the United States Trade and Development Agency uh, to produce a cloud center of excellence business strategy. So this pretty much uh, encompasses everything that should be addressed for cloud adoption from operating plan or the scope of work all the way to financing uh, model. So I think the private sector's role when we already established the, uh, this is a three-year business plan, uh, is that uh, there should be a sustainable funding model through a public-private partnership or PPP between cloud service providers and uh, the department. Thank you. All right, so you heard it here first. The cloud COE is going to get set up in the Philippines and there's an opportunity for us to be everybody flying to the Philippines to get trained up <laughs> on this, on cloud skills that we need. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us in this particular session on uh, ASEAN Cloud. Really, really want to thank you for your time and opportunity to interact with everybody. Uh, I think that uh, my guests are all available on, on LinkedIn. If not, we are more than happy to be connecting you with them directly if you need to have a further discussion. I am going to hand the time uh, back to you. Thank you very much for joining us today and have a very good afternoon. Thanks, man. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.